All right, chapter 19, part one, about liquids. So we've already talked about solids and atomic structure, and now we're moving on to liquids. Okay, in the liquid phase, molecules can flow freely as they slide over one another. And a liquid takes the shape of its container. So it is not compressible, you can't make it take up less space, but it will take the shape of whatever container you put it into. <clears throat> All right, liquid pressure. Pressure, remember, is force per area. And liquid pressure depends on gravity and the density and depth of the liquid. So how deep you are in the liquid and how dense it is. Remember, density is how much stuff there is in a certain volume, in a certain amount of space. All right, so a liquid exerts forces on the walls and the bottom of the container. On anything it touches, it's exerting a force. Even if you put an object in it, it's exerting forces on it. All right, so remember, pressure is force per area, so it's very similar with liquid pressure. The pressure that a block exerts on a table is the weight of the block divided by its area of contact. So you have a block, it takes up a certain area. If you make it take up more area, but it's the same weight, then it will be less pressure. Remember our example of a high heel shoe has a high pressure because it's a small area whereas a uh, boot would have a lower pressure because it has a larger surface area touching the ground, distributing that force. So the pressure um, of a liquid in this cylindrical container exerts against the bottom of the container is the weight of this liquid divided by the area of the bottom. So that would just be our basic principle of how do you calculate pressure. The weight of the liquid divided by the area of the bottom. However, You'll see that's not how we use liquid pressure because that is not the most useful to us. Um, all right, so we're ignoring for the moment additional atmospheric pressure. So we're ignoring the weight of um, the atmosphere around us because it has a weight on us. So the liquid exerts a pressure against the bottom of the container just like a block would exert pressure against the table. Same thing. Turn it into a block of ice, same, same principle. All right, so density. How much a liquid weighs Thus, how much pressure it exerts depends on its density. So, um, if it is a more dense liquid, so think it's thicker than water or something like that, it'd be more dense. If it's more dense, then it will exert more pressure. It's heavier, basically. Um, so, mercury is 13.6 times as dense as water. And for the same volume of liquid, the weight of mercury, so the same amount, the weight is going to be 13.6 times the weight of water. So you would not want to swim in a pool full of mercury for multiple reasons, but liquid pressure being one of them. The pressure of mercury on the bottom is 13.6 times the pressure of water. Right, for any given liquid, the pressure on the bottom will be greater if the liquid is deeper. So in the first container, the pressure is twice as much as the second container um, because the second container has half as much liquid in it. So it's got half the weight. And it depends on the depth, right? So it's half the depth. Okay, same here. Two blocks versus one, one is going to have a greater amount of pressure than the other. The, having the two blocks is larger pressure than one block. And then the depth does the same thing. This is a smaller depth, smaller pressure. Larger depth, larger pressure. So the pressure of a liquid at rest does not depend on the shape of the container or the size of its bottom surface. Okay, it does not depend on what container it's in or how much surface area there is at the bottom. It depends on the depth. Also, liquids are practically incompressible. You cannot make them take up less space. So at any temperature, um, they won't do it, mostly. Um, so the density is pretty much the same. Doesn't matter how deep you go in the ocean, the water is still going to be about the same density. All right, so at a given depth, a liquid exerts the same pressure against any surface, the bottom or size of its container, or even the surface of an object submerged in the liquid to that depth. The pressure a liquid exerts depends on density and depth. So here's our equation. You need to know this. Pressure due to liquid equals density times g. That's the acceleration due to gravity. We approximate as 10 meters per second squared times depth. The total pressure of a liquid is that 
plus the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, so we add in the atmosphere, that gives us total pressure. We won't talk about that too much. All right, volume. The pressure of a liquid does not depend on how much liquid you have. It depends on density and depth. So it doesn't matter if you have a small ocean or a large ocean, it just depends on the density of the water and the depth. For example, a large but shallow lake versus a small but deep lake. The deep lake um, puts more pressure on this dam because it's deeper. Same density of water, more depth. So also the pressure of the liquid is the same at any given depth regardless of the shape of the container. So at the top, same pressure. At the bottom, same pressure. Doesn't matter that these containers are shaped differently. Same pressure straight across in a straight line. We call those what you just saw, the Pascal's vases. They illustrate that water pressure depends on depth and not on volume. Also, water seeks its own level. So you'll notice the water is all at the same level in all of these, even though they're different shapes. Water seeks its own level. Go test it at home. It's really easy. Get a little tube, pour water in one end, it's going to level out. Um, so therefore, the pressures at equal depths are the same. Also, so we said it exerts forces on an object. You put an object in water, you get forces all over it. They add up to a net force that's perpendicular to each surface. And let's say you have a cup of water, you put a hole in it. It's going to, that force, since it's perpendicular, is going to initially move perpendicular to the surface. So it'll initially go straight out and then it will bend as gravity pulls it down. All right, so a brick mason wishes to mark the back of a building at the exact height of bricks already laid at the front. How can he measure the same height using only a garden hose and water? Answer, he can take a garden hose that's open at both ends from the front to the back of the house and fill it with water until the water level reaches the height of the bricks in the front. Since water seeks its own level, the level of the water in the other end is going to be the same. So water seeks its own level, put water in one end until you get to the height you want, it's going to be the same at the other end. What determines the pressure of a liquid? It's density and depth, also gravity. Buoyancy. When the weight of a submerged object is greater than the buoyant force, the object will sink. Right, so the weight is larger then the buoyant force, the force pushing up, it's going to sink. When the weight is less than the buoyant force, the object will float. So when the weight is smaller than the force pushing up, then it's going to float. Buoyancy is the apparent loss of weight of objects when submerged in a liquid. So you know, you, you get into the swimming pool and you don't feel like you don't weigh quite as much as when you're standing on land, or have you seen pictures of people in the Dead Sea? Um, they seem to weigh almost nothing because they're sitting right on top of the water. That's buoyancy. Also, it's easier to lift a boulder that would be on the bottom of a riverbed than to lift it above the water surface. Um, when the boulder submerged, the water puts that upward force on it and that is our buoyant force. So here's our boulder. There are forces all over this boulder. This is the pressure of the water at each level exerting on the boulder. So that's why it's a smaller pressure at the top because it's less deep and here it's more it's deeper so it's going to be a larger pressure exerted on it. So this one's larger than this one so overall it's a net upward buoyant force. That doesn't mean it doesn't sink though. That's the weight would have to be less than the buoyant force. All right arrows show us all those forces. The forces are greater at greater depth right because depth is, pressure is due to depth and the forces acting horizontally cancel each other, so it's not going to go sideways. Um, and the forces that act upward are larger than those acting downward, so that difference, upward minus downward, is our buoyant force. So when the weight's equal to the buoyant force, it's just going to stay at its level. All right, when an object is submerged, it displaces the volume of water equal to the volume of the object itself. So you take the rock, you put it in the water, it displaces that volume of liquid. That volume is the volume of the stone. That's how you can find a volume of an irregularly shaped object. So a completely submerged object always displaces a volume of liquid equal to its own volume. 
When an object is submerged, um, the volume of water overflowing is equal to the volume of the object. So another way to do it, rather than finding the difference in the volume change, you let it overflow and l look at the volume of the water that's come out of it. So when they take this rock out, there's going to be empty space at the top. And that'll be the amount of water that it displaced when it went in. So what determines if an object will sink or float? If the weight is less than the buoyant force, it will float. If the weight is more than the buoyant force, it will sink. Archimedes' principle states that the buoyant force on an immersed object is equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. All right, so the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid that it displaces. Not the weight of the object, but the weight of the amount of liquid that it will displace. So you have a liter of water, one liter occupies a thousand cubic centimeters, has a mass of one kilogram, and therefore weighs 10 newtons. Weight is force, uh, mass times acceleration. So if the mass is one kilogram, our acceleration is 10, 10 times one is 10, 10 newtons. Any object with a volume of one liter will experience a buoyant force of 10 newtons when you put it in water. So a whole one, doesn't matter what's in the one liter. If it's one liter of lead, whatever it is, it's gonna displace one liter of water and therefore, um, it will have a 10 Newton buoyant force. So immersed either means completely or partially submerged. So you put your one liter container halfway in, it's only displacing half a liter of water. You put it all the way in, it's displacing one liter of water. So if it's displacing one liter, it has 10 Newtons of buoyant force, it displaces half a liter, five Newtons of buoyant force. So unless the completely submerged container becomes compressed, the buoyant force will equal the weight of one liter of water at any depth. Doesn't matter where you put it, the buoyant force will stay the same no matter what depth you're at because it's the difference in the upward and downward forces. Um, so it's going to displace the same volume of water, therefore the same weight of water at whatever depth you're at. So that's the buoyant force. All right, a brick weighs less in water than in air. The buoyant force on the submerged brick is equal to the weight of the water displaced. You have your brick, it weighs three newtons. Goes in the water, displaces two newtons of water, so now it weighs only one newton. Because two newtons is our buoyant force pushing up, and three newtons was our weight going down, so three minus two going up leaves us with one newton. All right, so a 300 gram brick weighs three newtons in the air. It displaces two newtons of water. So the buoyant force is two newtons, so it weighs less, apparently. That is the apparent weight. The weight in air minus the buoyant force. For any submerged block, the upward force due to the water pressure minus the downward force is the weight of the liquid displaced. As long as it's submerged, the depth does not matter. It's the same at any depth. See, one minus two is, is one. Four minus three is one. Six minus five is one. Leaves you with one Newton of buoyant force at all of them. All right, this one liter container, it's filled with mercury, has a mass of 13.6, weighs 136 Newtons. What is its buoyant force? Trick question. The buoyant force is the weight of one liter of water, which is 10 Newtons. So the buoyant force is 10 newtons, the weight is 136 newtons, therefore it will sink. All right, which position is the buoyant force the greatest? They're all the same because the amount of water displaced is the same at A, B, and C. And the upward minus downward forces is the same. Finally, a stone is thrown into a deep lake. As it sinks deeper and deeper, does the buoyant force on it increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? The volume does not change. So the buoyant force does not change because it's displacing the same amount of water. However, the pressure does increase as we get deeper and deeper. So Archimedes' principle. Buoyant force stays the same no matter what depth, um, but what it really is is the amount of water displaced, the weight of that is the buoyant force. Okay, and that is tried and true. Ships or anything, that's how it works.